uh, this country has made over the centuries. So uh, give yourselves a round of applause for being here today in this place of celebration. Come on, you can give yourselves a round of And we want to thank you all for being here this afternoon. Um, I, didn't, I, thought, I thought somebody was singing, but I think it's us. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so just, just to begin, um, as I said, we're here to celebrate. We're here to acknowledge Juneteenth. We're here to uh, commemorate all that has transpired since 1863 um, and what led us up to that so as I began to think about and reflect on these reflections and, and what I would say on, on this day that, that means so much, I began to think about my time at uh, Duke University where I was a student. I studied under a professor, my favorite professor that I've ever had by the name of Willie James Jennings. Willie James Jennings at Duke University taught a course on the doctrine of creation doctrine of creation. It was a theological uh, program that I was in. Um, and so it was a theological, anthropological course that talked about the doctrine of creation. And it delved into the origins of our existence as human beings. That course sparked some interest in me and a deeper level of curiosity and it's a question, and a question arose for me as I finished that course that I still ask myself to this day. In fact, uh, I taught a course here as uh, an adjunct philosophy professor uh, on the question, the overarching question of what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be human? So that question has stayed with me, and it's a question that I ask today. And I often think about what it means to be human from the framework of our world and our society. The various religious and social and theological and anthropological and philosophical frameworks that are supposed to help explain what it means to be what it means to be in existence as human beings. And, and oftentimes I've found, unfortunately, that those particular ideas and frameworks that help us try to understand what it means to be human contradicts the very theological ideas of what creation says we, human beings are. And so I wrestle, I don't know about you, but I wrestle a lot with that. What does it mean to be human, but then living in a world that sort of dehumanizes us in many ways, shapes, and forms. So I struggle, but I think that's what theologians and pastors and preachers and philosophers and everyday human beings should do. We should wrestle. We should engage these existential questions that are so difficult to answer. What I began to realize is that in the struggle, there's always this semblance of truth. And truth means that there are certain universal principles in the world that says being human means that you are valued. Being human means that you are loved. Being human means that you are respected, meaning I see you. See, the origin or the etymology of the word respect means spectator means I see and re the prefix means again and again and again. So in order to be human, we have to see one another over and over and over. I don't, I don't just see you in chapel on Thursday. I see you over and over and over again in every single aspect of our lives. So turn to somebody right now and say, I see you. I see you. Now, the person that you said, I see you, turn back to that person and say, I see you again. And again, and again, and again, I see and again, you. and again. 
That's respect. And respect is the fundamental idea of what it means to be human. I have to see you in order to see your humanity. And so when we think about these things, and I'm going to keep it moving, um, because I know you want to eat. <laughs> but when we think about Juneteenth, when we think about what led us up to that moment, it was the act of dehumanization that said, we don't see these particular human beings, and so we will objectify them and use them as tools to perpetuate and promote our own individual selfish ambitions. I'm talking about in the doctrine of creation that, that, that Willie James Jennings, Dr. Willie James Jennings shared with us in this, in this course was he went back to the date of 1444. 1444 in the 15th century when Portugal began to commodify black bodies. In 1444, we saw this move from that moment all the way through the annals of time and history. And then we reach a time around 1619, some people debate that date, but we're going to use it for today. 1619 was the day that has been recorded as the time when human beings who weren't seen as human reached the shores of this nation. 1619 was the time when black bodies became the tools that would build this country that we share in and inhabit today. 1619 was the time where the essence of humanity was torn asunder. 1619 was the time where human beings who weren't seen were forced to exist inside of prison cells called plantations, where terror and pain and suffering and death reigned supreme. 1619 was the commencement of an existence that was wholly antithetical to the doctrine of creation. Why do you say that, Rev? Well, if you give me a minute, just going to preach for about five seconds. But the doctrine of creation says that God, who is omniscient and omnipotent, all-seeing, all-knowing, and all-powerful, is free. And therefore, if God is free and we, as human beings, were created in the image and likeness of God, we are intrinsically free. So 1619 said that this is completely antithetical to who and what God created to be free. So for 244 years, 244 years after the year 1619, there were a people who were tortured, brutalized, humiliated, marginalized, and oppressed. But it wasn't until January 1st, 1863, that humanity stepped up and said that this is wrong. That humanity said that the oppression and the dehumanization of human beings is wrong. So on January 1st, 1863, a president by the name of Abraham Lincoln executed the Emancipation Proclamation. The Emancipation Proclamation says, and I quote, all persons held as slaves henceforward shall be free. Tapping into the doctrine of creation, tapping into the intrinsic nature of what it means to be human. In order to be human, you have to be free. And if I'm not free or you're not free and we're not free or if any one person isn't free, then none of us can be free. So all persons henceforth held as slaves on this land that happened to be colonized 
were proclaimed to be free. The problem was that even though Abraham Lincoln authorized from the power that he had as president, he just renamed something or he just reiterated something that already was. But he said that all were free January 1st, 1863. The problem was that those who still own human beings, that's paradoxical in and of itself. Those who owned human beings said, we're not gonna listen to Abraham Lincoln, nor are we gonna listen to the doctrine of creation that theologically says that human beings are free. And so for the next two years, those slave owners said, we're gonna dismiss the Emancipation Proclamation and we're gonna deny the freedom of these human beings, even though they had by the country been proclaimed free. We're gonna ignore it. We're gonna deny it. And we're gonna to continue to own them as property. And for the next two years, 730 days, they held human beings in a state of enslavement. But on June 19th, 1865, which is why we're here today to celebrate the last community of enslaved Americans in Galveston, Texas, finally received word that they had been freed from bondage and General Gordon Granger ensured that the proclamation was enforced. How many of you know that we need some enforcers of freedom? See, even though we claim freedom, there are those who will deny it. And though we claim freedom, there are those who will ignore the proclamation of emancipation. Even though that there are those who know intrinsically that all human beings are called to be free and created in the essence of freedom, there are those who will say it doesn't matter. We're going to continue to constrain, to constrict, to oppress, to marginalize, even in 2024. They will continue to be people who will deny the intrinsic nature and character of humanity that says theologically, philosophically, sociologically, psychologically, biologically, religiously, whatever it is, that all should be free. There are those who will deny that, which is why we need enforcers of freedom. So Juneteenth. Juneteenth honors that day of freedom. Tertullian, an African theologian from Carthage, once said, though one cannot parcel out freedom in pieces because freedom is all or nothing. Juneteenth is a celebrate of, celebration of freedom for all, especially those who have been marginalized and seen and still are seen in many ways as non-human or at least sub-human. Juneteenth is a celebration of freedom that is fundamental to the doctrine of creation. And it says that all must be free for all and not in pieces. This is why Angela Davis said that freedom is a constant struggle. And therefore, freedom is never free. It's going to cost us something. If we really want to see somebody free, if we really want to see humanity elevated to the point that humanity is called to be, then every single person who believes in that fundamental principle will sacrifice for the freedom of all. If not for the person that you're sitting next to, standing next to, working with, then for yourself. Because as I said before, if one person is not free, none of us can be free. Thank you, Vega. I appreciate you. And so today we celebrate. Today we are reminded what freedom and what freedom is. We are reminded what humanity is. We're reminded of the importance and the essentialness of every single person being seen and recognized for the value and the worth that they are and that none of us are tools to be used for 
the ends of those who have power and privilege. As the theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said, since God in God's fullness of God's essence is free, freedom is inextricably bound to creation. The only means for true freedom, Bonhoeffer said, is to be for and to be with one another. Freedom never happens in isolation. Freedom always happens in relationship. Freedom is paradoxical in its nature because we are bound, connected to each other. And that's what brings freedom. So today we celebrate being for and with each other. Today we celebrate the right progress that needs or has been made in history and still needs to be made, but we celebrate those who are dedicated, committed, and willing to sacrifice in the name of love. Because as my teacher, my savior, Jesus taught, that there's no greater love than to sacrifice or give one's life for a friend. So I'm going to have to sacrifice. We're going to have to sacrifice if we truly want to see. I'm coming full circle. Here I go. I'm closing. <laughs> if we truly want to see, I'm going to, if I, I'm truly going to respect and see you over and over and over again, then I'm going to see your chains. And if I see your chains, I can't unsee your chains. And now I have to do something in order to break the chains that keep you constricted from being the fully human self that you are created to be. That means, Karsten, we walk in adjacency. That means that I walk with you wherever you go and you walk with me wherever I go. And if there's any constricting force that keeps us from being and living our full lives, that we will do everything to break those chains, even when we walk through the valleys of the shadow of death. I'm gonna walk with you, because I know that if I walk with you or you walk with me, when I'm going through the dark night of my soul, going through hell and high water, if I'm with you and you're with me, when we get to the other side, I know I have a friend indeed, because you went through it with me and I went through it with you, and therefore we know that freedom Freedom is a reality that can never be compromised. So let us celebrate today. Let's celebrate freedom today. But let's be also mindful that we have a lot of work to do. And that it starts here and it starts with us. That if I'm not doing it, that if I'm not embodying freedom, and if I'm not fighting for the freedom and advocating for the freedom and sacrificing for the freedom of those who are not free, then we will never see beloved community. Because beloved community requires freedom for all. It starts here. It starts with us. Happy Juneteenth. Now go get some food and celebrate with one another. God bless you. God keep you. And may God's face continue to shine upon you. We have refreshments. We have food. We have drinks. We have, more importantly, fellowship. And I hope that you all will have conversations about what it means to be human, what it means to be free, and what it means to see and love one another as you sit and have conversations to celebrate this moment in history that has given us a little bit or a semblance of hope that the best is still yet to come. God bless you.